is Bob Sullivan with Sullivan Financial and with in cooperation with uh, Queen Anne's County Chamber of Commerce this is the first uh, tenant of our financial literacy piece and I have uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Bucatman with us from College Planning Services of America and uh, Kevin is a college planner and one of the big things today that uh, um, that we realize is that uh, inflation is a part of life and unfortunately it's really hitting colleges and just Kevin tell us about that if you'd be so kind. Well thanks for having me Bob I appreciate being here and uh, well it all started a uh, very long time ago I'm going to tell you a little story about Harvard University uh, and what it cost to attend Harvard back in 1816 which is 200 years ago and if you take a look at what Harvard cost they included things like room and board, which was $115 for the year. Uh, the tuition was uh, about $55, and they also put in uh, cost of attendance that included a laundress, and of course every student had to have a manservant. And then finally, uh, there was a, uh, an allowance for candles and uh, for uh, lamp oil. So the entire cost for Harvard in 1816 was a whopping $600. Fast forward to today, if you translate that to 2016 dollars, then Harvard today should only cost 8,300, and yet it costs 65,000 dollars to attend Harvard. My goodness. Well, since 1978, inflation has caused uh, tuition to increase by 1,120 percent, which is an amazing number. And if you add in the fact that uh, many schools are now putting in graduation rates based on six years of attendance, not four, you can understand why college has become so unaffordable these days. And the main reason would be because if you look at what tuition increases are annually, which are three to six percent, and you put that against today's inflation rate of one to three percent, well over the 38 years since 1978, that's why you have 1120% increase in tuition costs at a college or a university. Absolutely staggering, staggering. Uh, tell us about the admission process, Kevin, and has that got more difficult? Well, because of the inflation rate, what has happened is uh, something uh, as recently as 2008. And uh, I think many of the uh, people watching this will remember one morning when they woke up and looked at their stocks and investments sure, and yeah. retirement in 2008 and pulled their hair out when they saw right. a loss of 37 percent. Sure. Well, not only did it affect them, but it affected the college endowments as well. Mm -hmm. And they still have not uh, recovered even up until now. So what has happened is uh, colleges, public universities are the ones that are uh, increasing by the thousands the number of applicants that they get because they are perceived as being more affordable than the private colleges and universities. As a matter of fact, the University of Maryland this year had 30,000 applicants for only 4,100 seats. Wow. And the University of Delaware, 26,000 applicants for only 3,800 seats. So on top of that, because there are so many more applicants, the uh, admission standards have increased ridiculously where ACTs for the University of Maryland have to range between 29 and 33 on a scale of 36 and the new SAT results median scores would be about a 1360 to a 1400 out of 1600 so it's been an amazing amount of applicants it has become extremely hard to get into these public universities and what that has done though is it has opened up an opportunity for students to attend private colleges and universities because there are empty seats there and they are willing to make more deals in terms of coming to uh, better tuition and better fees and uh, uh, better financial aid packages uh, than they did uh, even 10 years ago. Yeah, I know, Kevin, one of the stories you've told me, it's kind of like you're on an airplane somewhere and it's like everyone, uh, if you ask the six people around you they, what they paid for their ticket, it's all different. And that's exactly the same with the uh, universities, no matter if they're public or private. Uh, because of the uh, 
way that financial aid is calculated and the way that uh, schools are awarding financial aid these days, it uh, becomes increasingly difficult to pinpoint exactly how much a school would cost a family. Now, what has happened on top of that is that now colleges and admission counselors in, uh, uh, let's cut that a little bit. College admissions counselors are now looking for more well-rounded individuals at the private colleges and universities, which gives students that don't have terrific GPAs or SAT or ACT results a better chance of getting in because of the thousands of applicants at public universities. All they're looking at are GPAs, SAT scores, ACT results, and that's about it. So what has happened is uh, when you look at uh, schools today, uh, many college uh, admissions counselors are telling the guidance counselors at the high schools, here's what we're looking for. And what we're looking for are students that are challenging themselves. They're not just taking regular standard academic classes. They're pushing themselves and challenging themselves to take AP classes and to take honors classes so that the weighted J GPA comes up a lot higher and that's uh, the type of student that uh, the colleges and universities are looking for. Excellent information, Kevin. Hey, tell me about what is the expense uh, of uh, that, 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 that a family needs to plan for? Well, before a student even goes on to campus from day one, there are expenses. Uh, first of all, uh, there are the uh, fees to take the SAT, ACTs, and the standardized tests that colleges are looking for. So those can range anywhere from 50 to $75 a test. Then you take a look, the student gets back their results, and unfortunately they take a look at their results and they're not satisfied. So what are they going to do? They're gonna hire a tutor, they're gonna hire a program, they're gonna go look for somebody who's gonna get those scores up. And that could range anywhere from 800 to $2,000 uh, for a class or an individual tutor to get those results up. Then they go visit the colleges and there's a campus uh, visit costs, especially if you have to stay overnight in a hotel. Uh, there are also the application fees for each of the universities, which sometimes are waived, by the way, uh, if you do visit the campus and show interest. And then finally, there's the housing and tuition results and deposits when a student finally decides on their choice of school. And of course, there's the move-in expenses and uh, finally the personal expenses, putting some money in the account so the student has some spending money. So the time all is said and done, it could be $1,500 to $7,000 before a student even begins wow. the, their college wow. career. And this is in addition in to, addition to tuition, the tuition, the and room and, and, like that. and meal plans, and uh, the cost of attendance uh, includes things like, of course, the textbooks, which uh, now are three or $400 a piece, and personal expenses, and of course, getting back and forth from school uh, during vacations and uh, summer sessions. How are colleges determining uh, their need for assistance today? Well, it's interesting because there are several different ways that uh, colleges can do that. First of all, they use the federal format, which is the FAFSA. That's the Free Application for Student Aid. It's a mouthful to say, but everybody knows it. And so the FAFSA is the first financial aid form that schools look at, and almost every school in America, and even Canada, looks at that result. So that's number one. Number two, uh, each state, including Maryland, has their own state grant program. And the state grant program is need-based only. So if a family does have need, uh, there could be significant money for students who stay in state, or in some cases attend a school that may be in a surrounding state. Thirdly, some schools, more expensive and elite, have their own institutional form. So it's not enough that they get the FAFSA results, they want to know more about the family, and so they have their own form that uh, requires the family to divulge more and more about their financial condition. And if that wasn't bad enough, these same 600 to 650 schools require something from College Board called the CSS Profile. The CSS profile differs from the FAFSA in that the FAFSA only has about 90 questions to answer. However, the CSS profile can have over 600. And uh, each school not only has a base set of questions, but some of them have in supplemental types of questions that even ask what make and model car the family has in their garage. My goodness. Are there, are, is there a commonality of types of mistakes, Kevin, that uh, parents make? And, and, and while we're on the subject, I know this is your expertise. Um, 
how do you help them avoid those kinds of mistakes? Well, the common mistakes on the FAFSA, first of all, it's as basic as a parent's name. And that may sound a little bit strange, but the parent's name has to match what the name is on that parent's Social Security card. Now, if you're like me and you haven't seen that Social Security card in the last I millennium, you can go to the uh, Social Security uh, website, which I think is www.ssa.gov, and you can get an actual picture of what your Social Security card looks like by entering in your information. So once you've done that, then you can sign and uh, enter your information on the FAFSA the correct way. Because something as small as an uh, apostrophe uh, can throw off the uh, FAFSA where it will not recognize a parent's name. Then the next thing would be uh, some families will say, you know what, not sure where Johnny or Janie is going to go to school yet, but when they get in, we'll file a financial aid at that point. Well, the financial aid forms have deadlines, just like school sure. application sure. Uh, admissions uh, have their deadlines. And when are those deadlines, if I may ask? They can range anywhere from the beginning of January all the way to May, and some schools don't even have a date uh, where they have to get the forms available. So would but it be earlier is better? Earlier is much better. Okay. Because if you miss a financial aid deadline and not know it, uh, schools don't care. They essentially say, better luck next year when you file your financial aid forms again, because as you know, this is an annual process. The other mistake that they make is marital status. In other words, uh, uh, for the FAFSA, it's really the custodial income, uh, which would include the custodial parent and a step-parent if they remarried, does not include the non-custodial parent. Yet, some financial aid forms do include the custodial parent's information as well. So reporting that correctly is of the utmost importance to maximize your financial aid. My and yeah, yeah, it sounds like a lot. Now, is there a big difference between this FAFSA and, and the uh, CSS profile? Very, some enormous differences. And the enormous differences really start very basically. The FAFSA does not ask for the uh, net worth or the equity in a home, the primary residence of the family, okay. yet the CSS does. The, uh, FAFSA does not look at retirement assets that a family has. Okay. The CSS does. Um, they take a look at things like uh, uh, indebtedness on the CSS profile, where on the FAFSA they do not. So that's why there's a huge difference in the number of questions asked between the FAFSA and the CSS profile. And having that information available is very important uh, before you file those financial aid forms. And in all honesty, let's, let's say about it, the, the average person, um, you know, work-a-day world, they're busy. And uh, I know we have some really great guidance counselors that are very helpful. And I know that's one of the reasons you're, you're referred, referred and brought in, is the guidance counselors are doing their best to do a good job for some excellent students. And you're the extra level of defense, would you say that? Uh, that's a fair way to put it, Bob, definitely. Uh, guidance counselors are terrific at uh, working with the students to make sure that they uh, have a, an appropriate school list, uh, that they are uh, applying to schools that uh, are not only, uh, in some cases, reach schools, but safe schools as well, and schools that uh, match a student's personality and the major that they want. However, when it comes to financial aid, there's so much that many people don't know and what you don't know can cost you a lot of money when it comes to financial aid on an annual basis. Uh, and college and universities being as expensive as they are today, sure. Sure. it doesn't make sense to uh, go into this process with at least being educated about the process. Sure. Well, what type of aid uh, is available and, and when do you apply for them, that, those kind of things? Kevin, if you could address that. Sure. There are four different types of financial aid. Uh, there's grants, there's scholarships, there's work study, and there's loans. Now everybody wants grants because they're need-based, number one, and they start at the federal level depending on what the FAFSA uh, tells the school and the federal government about a family's ability to pay. So the federal government has a Pell Grant that can be up to $5,775 per year, and they have a piggyback grant called a CIOG, which is uh, the uh, educational grant that could add another 1000 or two to that award as well. Mm -hmm. So those are all need-based, and I'm talking just at the federal level, not including the Maryland state grants that we mentioned earlier. Then we take a look at scholarships, and everybody wants scholarships. Scholarships is where the money is, of course, 
And uh, like Willie Sutton, you know, why do we rob banks? Well, that's because that's where the money is. Yeah. So let's look after scholarships. Well, with scholarships, what happens is the school, upon acceptance of the student, will run that student through every single scholarship that that college or university offers. So you don't have to worry about missing out from the school, they'll let you know. Mm -hmm. But there are many outside scholarship opportunities that guidance counselors, guidance directors, guidance departments sure. know about, sure. and uh, students should be absolutely be able and, to. And that kind of thing, okay. No question. So uh, scholarships would be based on merit, they could be athletic, they could be based on art or musical talent. And so uh, there are many places online that are vetted by the uh, United States government uh, to look for scholarships. Uh, one of the uh, rules of thumb I would tell you is never pay for a scholarship search uh, because they're the ones that uh, normally are not going to do much for you. Really? But the ones that are vetted by the uh, United States government are free. They do not ask for personal information, really? rather just a username or a password hmm. to access their website and the data that they have there. And do you know what, what's the name of the free Some of them are services? Uh, www.fastweb.org. Uh, uh, There's uh, also uh, collegescholarships.com. Uh, so there are several, okay. and uh, if uh, people email me, I'd be happy to send them that that's, information that, that's, as well. That's really great. Um, Absolutely. Then you have work study. Okay. Work study is a little job on campus for the student working about five or ten hours a week in exchange for some money, and that is usually about a thousand to two thousand for the year. Now what happens is that's part of the financial aid package that a family receives, but lo and behold, when the bill comes, it's nowhere to be found. And the families ask themselves, well, where did that money go? Well, it's actually not going to the family. It's actually being paid directly to the student as a job well done. And if the student sets up an automatic uh, uh, debit or uh, you know, a bank account where the money can be transferred, every two weeks it goes into their account like clockwork. Now, the reason why that's not a bad thing is because, like my daughter who's graduated from college in 2013, she had work study as well. And it just meant that I didn't have to imitate an ATM every time she called up and asked for money, which was much less seldom because that's, she had money that, coming that, that's in. That's a common call, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Dad, send money. Absolutely. Send it immediately. And then finally, the one that nobody likes to hear, but it's part of the uh, financial aid package, are loans. Right. And the loans can be either from the federal government, uh, where the student can borrow money without a uh, co-signator, right. and that could be for four years about $27,000 or so, wow. which is repaid uh, on uh, several different bases once the student has graduated and figures out how much a month they can afford to pay back. And then there are the private institutions, banks like Wells Fargo or Discover, for example, Citibank, Citizens, they all have them, and those are the loans that a student can borrow but needs a cosigner. Okay. And then finally, the federal government will lend, just like to the student, will lend money to parents through the PLUS loan program. The PLUS loan program is very popular. It's a fixed interest rate and has a built-in guarantee that, God forbid, a uh, borrowing parent passes away, uh, all monies in that uh, that were borrowed by the parent are forgiven by the federal government. Wow, okay, that's a big deal. What does it take? Uh, they have a formula, Kevin, of some type, uh, basically uh, uh, how they base the need. What is that called? The EFC? The EFC, and the expected family contribution is the, the, the really the, the number that families need to know. Uh, expected family contribution is what the federal government thinks a family can afford to send one child to college for one year. And anybody that has filled out a FAFSA or received a student aid report from the federal government knows that they are overly optimistic about the amount of money that a family can afford to pay. A rule of thumb would be just based on income, the federal government thinks you can take 20 percent of whatever you earn and that would be the basis or only the beginning of what a family would be expected to pay for college. And that is an extremely high number, no matter if you earn five uh, or fifty thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars. Twenty percent is still a huge chunk of change to live without, mm -hmm. uh, no matter sure. what your income sure. level is. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, now I understand that in some cases uh, people do make some common mistakes and, and it's a good idea to have estimations of really what this uh, 
uh, EFC is uh, ahead of time, and, and how soon should we be looking at that? How soon should we be checking these things? Well, the uh, federal government uh, always makes the FAFSA available up until this year on January 1st, uh, but evidently uh, new legislation has been approved that the uh, new FAFSA uh, for the next fiscal year will be available not on January 1st, but this coming October 1st. So the 2015 federal tax return that you're using for this year's FAFSA will also be used for the following year's FAFSA. So for some families that's a blessing and for others it's a curse. It all depends on what kind of year that family had mm. and uh, there are of course explanations if there was a, a one hit wonder like the sale of a property or an inheritance. Uh, but families have to understand that uh, the federal government is going to take your word for certain things. Uh, for example, the value of your home uh, and uh, the value of your assets and things like that. And there are federal formulas available that uh, make it easy for a family to see if they're overestimating uh, those numbers. Okay, when you and I understand there's some just an out and out mistakes and that's something that, you know, you looking at a form uh, could tell if there is a mistake before Absolutely. it's submitted. Absolutely. It's always important to have somebody uh, review it just to be sure. Sure. Uh, because once you've made a mistake, for example, on that CSS profile that I talked about, that can't be changed. You'd have to contact all the schools that uh, received your CSS profile in order to make that change. On the FAFSA, you are able to make changes, uh, and usually those changes are for the annual income. Once you've entered your uh, assets and things like that, changing those kind of red flags, that FAFSA for financial aid offices, and they're going to ask why there was a significant difference Great. between the first time you filed and when you updated. So it is no short deal. Uh, I've heard you describe uh, college is what the second biggest expense a family is going to have. Behind a home mortgage, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you also have a rule of thumb with borrowing money. Can you share that with us? I'm of the feeling that whatever the major is that a student is going to be uh, majoring in, uh, whatever subject they're going to be and whatever career they're looking at, their total four-year indebtedness should be equivalent to their first year salary. So for example, if a student is in education and going to be a teacher, and we know the teachers earn somewhere between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars annually first year, that should be their total indebtedness. But if they're going to be an engineer uh, that's going to earn eighty or ninety thousand dollars, then that could be their first year indebtedness. But it makes no sense at all for an education major to attend a prestigious private university and emerge with a quarter million dollars worth of debt because they wanted to attend a named school and then spend the rest of their lives paying that loan back. Sure, because I understand that those loans uh, cannot be forgiven in bankruptcy. Correct. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of folks that are even having their Social Security access because they have not been able to repay those loans. So, Absolutely. So the federal we, government is happy to lend you whatever you need for your education, but they also expect to be paid back. And uh, that's why they are immune to uh, bankruptcy laws and to uh, forgiveness on uh, other types of uh, situations. Wow. And uh, that leads families sometimes into very precarious situations. Uh, where it's easy to borrow, but then when they get that bill and it starts mounting up year after year after year, uh, my rule of thumb essentially is that for every dollar that you borrow, you're going to be repaying two dollars. So I so think that so that's a a lot of money. A lot of money, and uh, you have uh, people that you know, and I certainly have clients that I know that sure. unfortunately sure. are in that sure. situation. No doubt about it. Well, I, I, Kevin, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for the time you've spent with us today. Hopefully, uh, some of our uh, listeners will, will appreciate it and take heed. Uh, Kevin, I understand you're available at uh, kevin at uh, cpsamerica.net, uh, and your phone number is, what, 610-726-1146, if someone has a, has a question. And your policy is, is you have a complimentary consult. Uh, anyone and um, they can talk to you, come and visit you, uh, whatever it is that they need, you'll be available to help them with. Well, I think the most important thing is that I consider myself to be a knowledge broker. I want to educate families as much as possible so that they make the best decisions 
regarding financial aid, regarding the school that sure. a student Makes is going to be attending. The world. Uh, always consulting somebody that's a college professional uh, is going to give you the right information uh, to create a, uh, an effective and realistic college list to be able to see what the actual numbers are going to be and uh, the resources that you're going to need to pay for college. Again, we're not in 1816 anymore. No. We're in 2016. I like those old numbers. And the old numbers work well for me, but today with public universities at $30,000, $35,000 a year and private universities approaching $70,000 a year. A lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a big expense, and people should know what they're getting into uh, to make sure that they make the right choices. There you have it, Dr. Kevin Bucatman uh, from College Planning Services of America. We'll call it straight from the horse's mouth. Thank you, Kevin. My pleasure, Bob. Thanks for having me.